people always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right, today's guest is one of the most knowledgeable magicians I know. Not only about the history of magic, but names of products, names of creators. He can remember details about acts from the past with amazing detail and so much more. He has an amazing collection of magic himself, and he even has a theater in his home where he brings in magicians and lecturers from all over the world to perform and teach magic to his friends. Um, he's also won several top awards in magic, but besides all that, he's a great guy whom I look up to and I'm proud to call my friend. Everybody, it's Mark D'Souza. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm doing great, Wes. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Uh, the babies are keeping Natalie up all night, so she's uh, she's lethargic. She uh, um, yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> not two at once, though. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, I, I was not that crazy. They're, they're, um, well, we didn't do it on purpose. They're teething no, right now, no. so, um, and she's awesome, Mark, so what she does is she takes the night shift, and then, um, I get up in the morning, and she sleeps in, but this morning she wasn't able to sleep in, because I had to run errands, so she's been up all night and all day, so, here we are. Yeah, <laughs> she'll take a nap after the podcast. So, um, there you go, she can just zone out, do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> so, um. First off, how are you feeling after the whole Sam incident? Uh, Mark was supposed uh, to lecture and perform at Sam and tested COVID positive the day before the convention? The day before I was to fly out. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, I started, I, I've been super, super, super careful the, the whole time this has been going on. We're, we're masked and vaxxed and boosted and this and that and, you know, um, my wife is immune compromised, so, you know, we're very, very, very careful about that. We don't eat out, you know, everything gets brought in. And um, so I, I felt a cold coming on Sunday before I was to leave, and I just thought it was a cold. You know, that's all it felt like, not even a bad cold. And I tested Monday, and I was negative, and I was set to fly it on Thursday. And Wednesday, I thought, you know, just to be sure, I'm going to test, and I test, and sure enough, I tested positive with a home test, and I immediately made a, an appointment to get a PCR test that afternoon just to double check. But my brother in law's doctor, and I also spoke to my doctor, and they said, if you test positive with a home test, you're definitely positive. And sure enough, I was. So, you know, horrible thing that I had to do to pull out of the convention literally at the last minute. I pulled out on, on Wednesday afternoon and, and I was to fly out Thursday and the convention started Friday night. So not only was I doing the convention, but I was supposed to be getting together with a few friends there before the convention. I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> I had to cancel all those plans too. Oh, um, now I'm even more gutted for you. Cause I know, horrible, I know your horrible. friends in magic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah. So I was really, really so very disappointed. I had, uh, you know, the act, you know, I've been working on this two new routines in the act for, for a couple of years now. And this was my, you know, opportunity to really show them off on a national audience. And uh, I, oh boy, I was really, really sad not to be able to do that. And uh, I had some great stuff together for a lecture. I shipped two boxes of product out beforehand on Tuesday. And, boy, it was a hassle getting all that stuff <laughs> back to me and, so I took a loss on this convention, but that was that was the least of my problems. I was so looking forward to getting together with so many friends out there, and uh, and uh, you know, in hindsight, of course, a whole bunch of people ended up you know testing positive, and, and there were problems galore out there. Uh, so I, I certainly was not the the only case, but uh, didn't make it any less. Uh, painful for me well that's what i was going to ask did everybody fill you in because there was acts like you canceling before there was acts canceling during and then a lot of people ended up getting sick on the way home uh, oh, while absolutely. they were there afterwards oh, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah i mean you know <laughs> there were certain people that got sick and when i found out i i, I messed with them and i said well everything that happens in vegas doesn't stay in vegas no. <laughs> Well, when you when you posted that you weren't going to be there, I was gutted. I went into the kitchen 
to make a cup of coffee or something. And Natalie looked at me and she said, why are you so bummed? I said, Mark has COVID. And she says, oh no, is he all right? Well, yeah, he said it was kind of just like a sore throat, but I just know that it's a lot of work to put on a, a lecture and a show at a convention. And I know he was looking forward to it. And man, I know what that did to me. So I was feeling bad for you, dude. Yeah, and I, you know, I got messaged by so many people that were, you know, they were so unhappy that I couldn't be there, but obviously everybody understood. And, uh, yeah, yeah, there's so nothing you can do, there. yeah. And, and you know what, I didn't even have the sore throat. I didn't even have that, I just had some congestion. Wow, <laughs> wow. You know, uh, Eric DeCamps, you know, he, I, 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 he and I have been so close for so many years. We, we refer to each other as our evil twins because people mix us up all the time. Uh, the Sus at the camps, you know, we're both big guys and we're loud. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I said, I thought I was the hard luck story. No, you were worse because you actually went there and you couldn't perform on the show. So <laughs> He got to lecture and then he disappeared. And it was exactly. like, well, yeah, yeah. Because he, yeah, he just started feeling sick and just, you know, stayed low and, didn't pass and he tested positive so now did he get the minor one also yeah yeah good yeah. good good yeah. now also he had, stay, he had to stay a few extra days before he tested negative so he could fly back uh and it was he had his flights out there so you know uh so um recently since then you just had surgery on your hand <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's scary. That's as a magician, that scares the crap out of me. So, can you tell yeah, me about that? And I'll, I'm sure. Yeah, what's that, going on? Good year. Not a good year so far. Um, yeah, this, this is not something sudden. Um, about eleven years ago, I started having some problems with my right thumb, and uh, went to a, a, a hand specialist, and he looked at me and he says, "Well, we don't need to do surgery. It's you know, just got some ligaments and this and that, and you know, you do some PT and wear a brace and it starts bothering you. Okay, great." And I saw him again, maybe five years later. Same thing. This time I went to see him and he said, yeah, that's not going to do it anymore. Now we got to do surgery. And so uh, basically they had to move ligaments around. They had to cut part of my bone. They had to do what they call a tightrope between two bones in my hand. And, um, and I saw him, I got my follow up uh, Monday and he said, everything went absolutely perfectly. Um, but it just takes time to heal. So my hands are going to split for four weeks. Uh, and I timed it so that, you know, I, I would I would have it after SAM and before physical. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Good that. job. But, yeah. But um, he said it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, three months before you're going to be back to getting back to normal. So is it your dominant hand or your weak hand? My dominant hand, my right hand. Yeah. So, um, uh, I had I had a turn down. I got asked to do an online lecture by a group in Germany. The Magic Circle wanted me to do an online lecture. Two other groups wanted me to do online lectures. Had to turn those down, uh, and a few shows. So, um, uh, no, it's okay. I mean, in the long run, I'll, I'll you know the hand will be a lot stronger, and I won't I won't be hurting all the time. Uh, but by uh, in two weeks, I, I, <laughs> I'm I doing a 15-minute Zoom show for my synagogue's fundraiser. And I didn't pull out of that. And, and basically what I'm going to say is, instead of doing sleight of hand, I will be slight one hand. There you go. So, <laughs> so I've got, I've got, I'm just doing three routines that I can do with one hand without a problem that require no skill, but uh, just presentation and that much I can still do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, one thing I love about the podcast that might drive some listeners crazy is I've known you. I first started going to MAES in 2008, and that's when I first met you and fell in love with you. So I've known you since 2008. Uh, I thought it was before then. Oh, is, yeah. it, is it 2008? Well, we got married in 2008. We were out there before we got married? You were out there. You were out here before you got married. Okay, 2005 then. So somewhere yeah. around there. Somewhere around there. But here's the thing. Um I never get to find out people's origin stories when you're hanging out with them. I've known you for years, but I have no idea. What was your start in magic? How'd you get started? When I was five and a half years old, uh, I went to a friend's birthday party and there was a magician. And I really, I really liked it. I mean, uh, this was something that I, I'd never seen before. I really liked it and wanted to find out more about it. And uh, then... We would watch, you know, back in those days, the Ed Sullivan Show, 
Sunday nights, 8 o'clock, I'd watch the Ed Sullivan Show, and he had all kinds of magicians on. And I remember seeing a magician on there not long after, and I backtracked it, and it was Rich Yardy. Um, wow. And so then I said, I really want to I want to learn to be a magician. So I bugged my parents and my grandparents to take me to the toy stores and, you know, get me a magic set, and then the SS Adams Blister Pack Magic Tricks. And uh, I did that for, for a couple of years, and uh, there were some books, some very simple books that I found. And uh, um, and then, I guess, when I was about nine years old or so, I found a bookstore in Philadelphia called Ben's Bookstore. And there was a magic counter in there run by a guy named Harry Reed. And, uh, and then that was the first magic shop where I bought tricks. So by the time I was about 10... I uh, kind of moved over to Canter's Magic Shop run by Lee and Terry Gray. And uh, by the time I was about 11 or 12, I really decided I wanted to do sleight of hand stuff. That's what I wanted to specialize in, not not just box tricks and stuff. And I like, you know, I did kids' parties, but I wanted to learn some more serious sleight of hand. So all the old guys saw that I was not going away and that I was serious. Uh, so they started teaching me stuff. And of course, all the old guys became my friends and, you know... <laughs> You know how that goes. Um, so that kind of was where it started. I started, I guess my first show was when I was eight years old at my cousin's birthday party. Um, and then I started doing, you know, shows in the neighborhood and then kid shows and got business cards printed. And it was actually two other kids in the neighborhood and myself uh, who banded together and the three of us would do shows together. And then the one older one dropped out and it was just the two of us left and that was another couple of years and then finally he dropped out and I just went solo when I was about ah gosh I must have been 13 or 14 so did you have a cool uh name as a as a duo well you know actually eventually when we became the duo uh it became Mark D and company uh, he was a passive solo guy. He had a passive guy, so he didn't mind being the end company. Okay. There you go. Because <laughs> Mark D and Company, and that, that lasted. And even after he left, it was still Mark D and Company because uh, I had some birds. I, had, I did doves and uh, did parakeets also for a while. And uh, I guess when I was about 18 or so, I became Mark Conrad. Uh, 17 or 18 and that was the day I, I was Mark on and I had a, a girl who was assisting me and you know it was doing for a while I was doing a lot of rock and roll magic doing uh, uh, did a gig with, with, with a live band a few times with David Bowie music's instrumental versions of Bowie music as the background I'm imagining you in spandex like Chesaday right now was it anything like that? well yeah we didn't go quite spandex it was satin and lamey I had a red satin suit with silver lame trim and uh, red platform shoes, really big red platform Good, yeah. shoes, and a lot more hair than you've ever seen me with. <laughs> wow. I need pictures. We need pictures. You need pictures. Yeah, I that can be, the, that can be the thumbnail for the For the podcast. podcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't work for that. <laughs> that will scare people. <laughs> So, who were your big influences growing up? Was it Richie Artie and who else? Or just well, that one appearance of Richie Artie is all you remember when you were a little kid? No, no, no. In, in actuality, um, when I was in my early 20s, I'm saying like 2021, 20, Richie Artie toured with his show and was in Philly for a week. Um, and there was an act on the show that I heard about because I was, I was like really into back in my teens and, and, Ever since my teens, I've been a real Anglophile, really into the English magic scene and the English magic magazines and stuff. So that's what I was reading and getting a lot of information about a lot of the European acts. And there was an act on the show uh, who had won the British Ring Award, a guy named Otto Wesley. Well, now everybody knows Otto because he worked with the Crazy Horse in Paris. Great comedy magic act. But back in those days, he did this wild act all with canes it was like just super fast pace act just with canes and he finished doing the razor blades with a hundred razor blades Goodness. and it was it was great so uh i wanted to see richard of course because i knew his reputation but i wanted 
I wanted to meet Otto, and Otto and I became quick friends. And we hang out like we hung out the whole week in Philly, and then then they went to New York, and they were at the Felt Forum in New York. So I'd go up for a couple of days and visit with them up there. So I got to meet Rich Yardy and hang out with Rich Yardy and go backstage and this and that. Uh, and Rich Yardy was just such an amazing guy. And then from then on, anytime I had the opportunity to see Rich Yardy, uh, I saw him. He was absolute best illusionist of the century. I mean, he was just incredible. There's never been a performer quite like him. Um, but that's that's not the kind of stuff I did. I mean, you know, Otto was more my speed. I mean, you know, like doing solo stuff. Um, my big influences there were there were two two areas. My stand up stuff that I did for real paying audiences was you know comedy audience participation type stuff. And uh, like I said, I was doing rock and roll shows, small rock and roll shows. I was like an opening act. I was doing coffee houses, this and that. So it was real comedy-based stuff. And again, I leaned toward English performers. Great, you know, classic performers like Alan Shaxson and and Michael Bailey, but people like uh, Pat Page and, uh, and Terry Seabrook was a huge influence on me. His comedy style when I saw him, the first time I saw him work, it was like I'd never seen anybody just that wild and free and just, you know, such an accent on the comedy more so even than the magic, but still tying it all together. So there was that side of me. But my real love is sleight of hand magic. I love silent manipulative acts, the classic acts from back in the 70s and 60s, 70s, 80s. So, of course, my hero is Fred Capps. Caps is, you know, the guy I idolize. Best magician I ever saw in my life. Could do everything. He did close-up. He did stand-up manipulation. He did patter stuff. He did comedy. He he could do anything. And and that was the guy that I idolized and try to kind of model myself after and, and, and study everything I could find on Caps, which wasn't a heck of a lot. So it meant I had to seek out people who knew him and, uh, and pick their brains and uh, study a lot of videotape or that I was able to scrounge together. Now you can see it on all on YouTube, but back in the, back in the you know, early eighties, that, that was, that was tough stuff to find. So uh, now see caps was before my time. I mean, I started magic, you know, 96 is when I started doing kids birthday parties. So, you know, I didn't find out. I just found out about Doug Henning about the time <laughs> that he died. I mean, cause I grew up watching Copperfield and Penn and Teller, but I didn't know who Doug Henning was until about the time. I mean, I knew about him like two, three years prior to his death. Right, but he wasn't performing then. Right, so I didn't know anything of him. Yeah. Um, so Fred Caps, did he do a full evening show, or was he more of a, yeah, a plug and play kind of guy, filler act? He was a he was a he was a cabaret worker primarily. Uh, he worked when he worked cabaret nightclubs it was pro- he would often do two spots in a show if he were in a full theater show he would do his manipulation spot in one half and he would do his 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 talk act in the second half okay and the stuff that was in his talk act i mean if you go now to youtube you'll get to see vi- plenty of video friend caps you'll get to see him in his head day, hey day and you'll you'll watch it and you'll say you'll first say well, this is kind of standard, but you know what? You're going to watch it again, and you're going to go, oh, okay, it's standard, but this is the guy that perfected it. Well, that's this why it's standard, because they're, they're copying, everybody's copying him. So, you know, you go and look at, you know, he performed on the Sullivan Show three times. Uh, he, his last performance, he was the act that followed the first appearance of the Beatles in 1964. Uh, that's a tough spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he came on, and he did, he did two tricks. He did a card trick which was the homing card, which was his, you know, kind of his calling card. Uh, and he did the salt board. And I don't think anybody got as much out of salt board than he ever did. Um, but before that, on another appearance, he did the Chinese sticks. Wow. Chinese sticks. He wasn't even expecting to do that trick. But Sullivan specifically requested it because he saw him do it in a Dutch nightclub. Well, here's, you know, the top impresario of entertainment of the world, Ed <laughs> Sullivan. And he says, I want you to do the Chinese Six. I don't want you to do your, your Grand Prix act. <laughs> oh, what are you going to do? You're going to do the Chinese Six. Yep. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to own the set of sticks that Caps used on that show. Wow. And 
Uh, and when I, I do a, I do a, a, a lecture performance called The History of Magic Through Performance, and in it, when I talk about caps, I use caps as Chinese sticks to do caps his own routine. Wow. Um, but, but boy, he was just at his close-up work. Oh, my gosh. And, and the funny thing about caps, he never invented a trick. He would always say he never invented a trick. But he would take other people's stuff, and he would perfect it. He would change it around to suit his, his skill set and to suit his personality, and he would just make these tricks perfect. Wow, I didn't realize he never invented anything. No, never invented a trick. So I would encourage you, you know, look, he said he never invented a trick. You know, there were handlings like Ken Brook, who was one of my mentors, great, great English magician. Ken Brook marketed a few things under his name. Right. Uh, a few of them weren't his originations, but they were his routines for them. Uh, he had a thing called the, the Chinese point trick, which I, I consider that's, that's an original trick. That's something the cats really did originate. Um, but you won't see a lot of people do it. I mean, I, I've seen maybe two two pros actually do the trick, because it's really hard to do well. Um, but, uh, you know, his, his stuff was just, just absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. I'm going to re-listen to this podcast and just pause every time you mention a name in a routine, and I'm going to see if I can Google it on YouTube. <laughs> you and anybody who's listening to go on YouTube and type in Fred Caps, K-A-P-S and, 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 and fall down the rabbit hole. You know, you'll watch one thing and that'll lead to another and another. You'll, 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 you'll end up watching a couple hours of this guy because he is just so good and so enchanting. And you'll hear other people talk about him, people who you know and, and, and respect who thought he was the best magician in the world. Yeah. No, I've, I've, I definitely know the name. I've definitely seen his. I've seen a couple things of his, but it's before my time, and you know, yeah. I didn't have that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. There were there were two other Dutch magicians that 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 were very influential. I mean, one very influential stylistically uh, was a guy named Richard Ross, who had won the Grand Prix twice. Yeah. A wonderful magician, and uh, Tommy Wonder, who I was so privileged to be friends with for close to 40 years wow. and and tommy whenever he would come to the states he'd, he'd stay with me and and we'd spend a lot of time just sessioning and, and, and playing with stuff and the guy was one of the great geniuses of the 20th century in magic uh just and and all three of them caps ross and and, and tommy were all taken from us way too young they they, they never reached 60 so you know uh, it's such a shame, but those those are all guys that that deserve a, a great deal of study. Wow. So, um, when did you start competing? My first competition, stupidly, <laughs> was the first convention I ever attended, which was 1968. It was the SAM National Convention in Philadelphia. I was 14 years old, so you can work out the math. Um, but, uh, I, I, I entered, they had at the time a junior competition and I was so woefully unprepared. It was, oh my gosh. I, I mean, I look back on what I did and I'm like, oh my God, what a train wreck. How did I even have the nerve to, <laughs> to compete? But, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, an opportunity for me to do it and, uh, I guess the next time I competed, I was a lot more prepared, which was 72 SAM in Philly. And, uh, and I took third place, which not bad. That's great for your yeah. second time. Yeah. yeah. But see, even that train wreck, you learned a lot. So oh, heck yeah. you can't yeah. tell people, you know, you're, it's a train wreck, but don't go. You're going to learn if they accept but, you to you comp know, compete, go do it. Oh, oh, absolutely. And, and MAS, which we've talked about already, uh, we've mentioned at least, is a great place to start. You shouldn't start at a national convention. You, know, you should start at a, a regional convention like MAS. And, and it's a great opportunity to compete, not, not just to get the experience of walking out on a stage in front of magicians, but more importantly, the feedback that you're going to get from people. And boy, I got feedback even back in those days. And, and I got to meet some people who, who 
I got to know well over a period of years and stayed friends with. I met Fantasio in 1968. He he won the the he won the senior stage competition, and uh, and I was friends with with Ricardo until he passed. And he shared a lot of stuff with me over the years, and uh, and taught me a lot of stuff. I used to use. I used to use the canes and candles a lot. I used to perform with that stuff a lot. And I learned the right way to do it from him. So, uh, you know, that was helpful. I, another guy that was in the competition that I, I helped out during his act was a guy named Nino Guerrero. A name nobody listening to this is going to know, unless you're from the West Coast. And Nino was was a, a, top, uh, a top cabaret nightclub act. Uh, on the West Coast back in the uh, 60s and 70s, and he was a student of a man named Jose Fraxen, who was one of the great Spanish masters of magic. And Fraxen taught him the cigarettes, and, and that's the routine that Nino you know, did as part of his act. And, and that was a great experience to get to get to see that and, and to know more about that at a young age. You know, that kind of that that started me off and giving me respect for. Yeah, magic history, whether it was old or new. At least learning about more about magic and more, learning more about magicians I, I've never heard of. I love your passion. I love your remembrance of these people and talking about them in high regard. It just, I, I love magic so much. And out here in Virginia, I kind of feel I'm in my own little bubble. Like, I don't have a group of magicians near me that are, yeah, you know, I'm the only full time guy locally. And, dude, I'm just eating this up. I love your passion, Mark. It's so awesome. Thank you. Thank I want you, I want you to you. brag a little bit. Um, I couldn't find a website for you in research for this, and you told me it's because you don't have one. So, um, what what are your magic awards? You have some pretty big awards. Can you list the big well, ones? I mean, you don't. We don't have an hour podcast. We have like thirty five minutes left. So okay. So so <laughs> so we'll, we'll cut to the chase. I've I've won over sixty regional, national, and international awards. Wow. I started competing in sixty eight. I retired in 97. In that time, I was a three-time IBM gold medal fa finalist. Um, I won the SAM stage competition twice. I won the SAM close-up competition. Uh, the same year, I won the IBM close-up competition. So that was the double win in 96. And I had said before those competitions, that was going to be my, my finale. That was going to be it, win or lose. That was my last competition. But when I won, the SAM said, we want you to represent us at FISM next year in Germany, 97. I said, all right, I'll do that, and that'll be it. So that was my last one. But I did compete at FISM three times, twice in stage, once in close-up. Um, let's see, what else? There, I've got three silver medals from the SAM. Um, I won the Milburn Christopher Award for close-up magic. Uh, that's enough. Ah, Lee. Yeah, that's enough. That's a lot. Um, why did you retire? I felt that, you know, I didn't want to be competing for 30 years. <laughs> it's, you know, to me, competition really is it's a young man's game. It takes, a, to do it right, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of passion and it's it's emotionally draining um i mean i know guys that go out there that just you know they'll just go out and perform now the guys that are winning the competitions really are putting big investment of time and and, and, and emotional content into that um like I said, you know, my Eric Camps and I became friends over competition. We competed against each other for years and years and years. And he'd win, I'd win, he'd win, I'd win, he'd win first, I'd take second. You know, we just went back and forth all the time. And we were always so overjoyed for the other's accomplishment. I mean, it was just, you know, that's what it was about. It was about, you know, doing your best. And when somebody did their best and you saw that, God, you just... You know, you were just overjoyed for, for the win for them, even even if it wasn't for you. Um, so, you know, I decided it was time for the younger guys to kind of take over. There was a competition I was in, uh, and there a, a, another friend of mine, and I, I won't mention his name, he's another MAS guy, but somebody that I was friends with since we were both 16 years old in the SAM, 
And he, I, I, I'll mention this. It's Mike Bonacci. Bonacci and I have known each other for years. But I love Michael. He's such a great guy. And a great competitor. And, and, and still, you know, he has that passion. And we, we both competed at SAM in, I guess it was 89. And uh, and the guys were talking. And Mike's, Mike's like two months older than me. But he looks much younger because he still has hair. Or at least did then. Um, and he was talking to some of the competitors. Did you hear who won? Did you hear who won? Did you hear who won? And, and one of the competitors, a young guy, said to Mike, oh, I'll bet it was the old guy referring to me. And I'm like, geez, I'm the old guy. I don't want to be the old guy. Wow. So, you know, I decided, yeah, that was going to be it. I was going to hang it up in 96, and did it again in 97. And since then, I mean, gosh, I've, I've judged so many competitions. And to me, the joy of it is not the judging, but being able to give feedback to people who, who really show the spark and, and try to help them out. And I've, you know, I've coached and I've mentored so many young magicians. And, you know, you, I mean, you've seen me at SAM, at, at MAS, and, and, you know, any kid that comes up to me, I'm, I'm happy to sit down and spend 20, 30, 40 minutes with them. And, and you know, I, after competitions, I'll come up, you know, I'll talk to these kids and they'll, they'll ask for feedback and I'll say, well, you know, if it were me, this is what I would have done differently. And uh, and I don't hold back. I'm, I'm terrible at, at, at lying. You know, people, you know, if, you're, if, if you're coming to me and saying, you know, how was I? And all you want is praise. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you a little bit of that. But if you really want to know, then I have all the time you need. Yeah. And, and I work with them. And I've worked with some of these kids for years. My thing, if if you're gonna compete at a at any level competition, talk to somebody that's done it and talk to them about your act. Me, I I tried to jump in that water by myself. You know, I didn't dip my toe yeah. in the water. I just jumped in. So I was one of the ones that showed up at my first convention and wanted to compete. And competing in front of a room full of magicians is way different than a lay audience. Oh, of course. And it's like, am I trying to am I trying to kill with these jokes and then stuff falls flat and it's like. Mm, they're just not, it's, it's a weird audience to perform in front of. And then I go in front of Penn and Teller, but that is a regular audience and Penn and Teller are cheering me on. The people in that audience are cheering you on, but it's just, it's different, man. It's different at a convention, so. Oh, totally. It's a totally different thing. And you have to understand that's the audience you're working for. Look, if you come out and try to do the commercial act that you do every night in front of a real paying audience, unless there's something different Either it's a different persona, you know, very different character, or if it's not just a bunch of stock jokes, if it's all original humor, and you've got some reasonably original magic or great twists on standard effects, it's not going to go great in front of a magician audience, except for the guys who are workers. You know, those guys will watch you and go, oh, this guy's obviously a worker. He's, he's in front of the wrong audience, that's all. Yeah. You know, and I could pick, put him in front of any audience any night of the week. And he's going to kill. He's going to kill. But, you know, magicians, totally different thing. So, you know, you've got to have, excuse me, you've got to have something different to try it out in front of a match. Either that or you need to just show a very high level of skill. Like manipul manipulators kill at conventions. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right, yeah. And, you know, well, you know, half the time they're like jugglers. Yeah. You know, the jugglers always steal the show at a magic convention because that's real skill. <laughs> um, so you as the MES auctioneer every year you blow me away with your knowledge I mean I've been going every single year and every single year it's like alright well I've been studying Mark I've been studying hard every day I'm watching magic tapes I'm reading my magic books I go there I'm like I'm going to know what Mark's talking about this year I'm going to know these names and value of items it's like i don't know what that deck of cards costs and you're like oh it's 24.95 and it was new it's probably worth 15 dollars now on ebay knockoffs you know them by sight you can oh that's a knockoff i don't want to sell this thing and i don't want to promote that crap and then or the worst it'll be we have an opening bid of this awesome thing for 20 dollars. and then you look at the guy selling it we're not going to sell this you put on ebay tomorrow you'll get 750 for it next <laughs> I love you, Mark. You're awesome. Man, you doing that auction, it's it's part of the highlight of the convention for me. That's one of my favorite things. I learn a ton every year whether I buy something or not. I, you know, I, and I, and I, I won't 
able to toot my own horn, but I get that, that from a lot of people. And Mike Miller is always asking me to do the same thing at Bob Little's. You know, when I'm available, I love doing it at Bob's too. And, you know, the, the fun of it, it's, it's not just an auction. It's, you know, kind of a show is uh, to, to some extent, but, you know, you got to keep things moving. Um, you know, I've been doing magic a long, 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 long time, and, and I've been very, 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 very serious about it a long, long time. So there's not a lot of stuff that, that kind of passes by my purview. Uh, I, I, I try to be aware of most of the stuff that's coming out on a consistent basis. Somehow it gets stored in my, you know, that database we call a brain. Um, so, you know, I just try to retain some of this stuff. Look, uh, a lot of the new stuff, that comes out, it's tough to keep up with a lot of it. Um, I, it used to be a joke. When I, I lived up in Harrisburg for, for about seven or eight years. And uh, my, my gang up there, we used to go up to Steve Dushek's once a month up in Hazleton. And for those who don't know the name Steve Dushek, my God, look it up. One of the greatest creative minds in magic of the 20th century. Absolutely incredible creative man. Uh, and we go up to Steve's to hang out for the, for the night on a Friday night once a month. And uh, so on the drive up, it was an hour and a half drive each way. Uh, all my friends would, they, they referred to me as Univac. Now, for you young guys, Univac was the name of one of the early computers back in the day. A computer that took up an entire room that still didn't have as much power as you have in your <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> you know? So they used, to, we, they used to play Stump Univac. So they would, they, would, they would describe an effect or name a trick, and I would have to tell them what book it was in. Uh, if I could get it narrowed down to a page, that would be extra points. Wow. <laughs> so it just became like a thing for me. I, I just, you know, being able to identify these things and just adding to my base of knowledge. And, you know, at my house, you know, I have a, I have a big library, but it's, I, I don't call it a collector's library. It's, it's a research library. Um, yeah, I've got some great collectible books. I've got some beautiful old stuff, but by and large, it's a research library, and, and I would say I probably have read the majority of 80 to 85 percent of the books I own, and I have a lot of books. Uh, the magazines, I, I read magazines cover to cover every month, the ones that I get still. Uh, so I want to be abreast of all this stuff, and uh, so it's important to me. So that's that's why that's why they asked me to do the auction. So another thing the listeners might not know, during the MAES that we did online during COVID, um, yeah. you arranged to have David Copperfield as a guest. And um, in my mind, you got David Copperfield on speed dial. Now, I know you're in the Philly area. Did you grow up? Did you know Copperfield as a young guy and you've known him all these years? Did you become friends with him later on? How'd that work out? Uh, David grew up in Metuchen, New Jersey, which is kind of a bedroom community of New York. Um, I used to go to New York frequently and go to Tannen's Magic Shop, and we met in Tannen's Magic Shop, and uh, we would cross paths at conventions and hang out and talk. Uh, it's not like we were close buddy buddies or anything, but, um, um, you know, we knew each other. We knew each other you know, back in the day. Um, and over the period of years, as he got bigger and bigger and, and uh uh, groups in the statue where he's at now. Uh, I mean, over the years, anytime I would see David, we'd always, you know, we'd always talk, you know, after the show, we, you know, we'd just say hi, you know, talk, this and that. And a few years ago, when he started really putting the museum together, um, he'd call me now and then and, and ask the questions, or, or Chris, Chris Kenner would, would call me and say, hey, David, what's talking about such and such? And just tell him to call me. Um, and we talked, you know, we was putting tannins together. He was asking me for my recollections of certain things. Um, and he has a, a project now that's, I guess, in the museum. Uh, I, I don't know if he wants to talk about it, so I, I better not speak. That's okay. That's okay. That typically, but there were some things he was looking for. And I said, well, do you want this one or that one? And he went, do you, do you have both? I went, yeah, just tell me what you want, you know. And I clarified some things, you know, that he thought. And I said, well, this is not what I remember. Here's what I remember. And, and so we, we've we always, you know, we've, you know, in the last, I guess, three, four years, we've gotten more closely in touch. Uh, so last time I was in Vegas, um, I, 
I had the privilege of doing the museum tour. And, um, and it was myself and uh, two people who are the organizers of the FISM convention coming up in July. And uh, another uh, wonderful illusionist named Ray Pierce from, from California. And when we pulled into the parking lot, there was somebody waiting for me. It was my buddy Jeff McBride. Now, I've known McBride since he was 14 or 15 years old. And we have been friends all these years because we come from the same place. We are deeply rooted in those manipulative acts from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we, we know them by heart. <laughs> That's a language we speak. <laughs> so... Whenever Jeff's in the area, we usually get together. Anyway, so anytime I would talk to Jeff, he would say, oh, so, you know, I was looking at this, and Copperfields would say, I, I haven't seen it. He says, you haven't been to the conference? Oh, my God. When you go there, I want to be there. Well, he found out I was going to be there and came along with the tour. And he was just, like, standing next to me the whole time. And I just keep, you know, asking questions, making comments, which you're not supposed to do. But because it was just such a small group, they, they didn't curb me too much. And Copper and, and, and McBride is just laughing you know, every time I make a comment. He goes, well, no, <laughs> that's not this. It's that. And, you know, <laughs> it's me. I won't say I was being a wise ass, but, you know, it was just me being me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we were supposed to get together on the trip this time also because there's, he wanted to show me the results of some things that I had sent him and that's you know when he's ready to talk about it we'll talk about that well the one of the highlights of my trip to sam was um i was told that on my next trip to vegas i get a tour of the museum and i teared up a little bit and i hope that didn't mess up my invite <laughs> because i love this world i love everything about it so i can't wait uh i will tell you there are a few there are a few things you will find more pleasurable in your entire experience of magic than taking that tour. Uh, I can tell you there's a, there's a moment near the beginning of the tour where something happens. And I know it's been talked about on air by other people, and I'm not going to talk about it. But yeah, that's okay. I just I just started crying. I it was so just, it's okay if I get emotional. It's okay. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, All right. But 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 you won't get emotional. Like people my age get emotional over this right, right. one thing. Something that happens is just like it takes you back to when you were 12 years old and, and you just lose it. <laughs> so, something personal to me, one of my favorite Robert Houdin is the uh, pastry chef. Does he have that oh, on, on display? Oh, 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 oh you, you hit the nail on the head. That is my favorite as well. Okay, he has uh, that. And, and yes, he does. <laughs> and yes, he does. <laughs> I yeah. can't wait. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and it's yeah. The when you when you see the Udan stuff, it's just oh, oh it's just it's 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 exhaustive. There's so much there. It's incredible. And and you know, as part of the tour he performs some things and one of the things he performs is the orange tree. And uh Wow. And he has three. <laughs> He's got three orange trees. How many did Robert oh. Dan have? <laughs> so he has, uh, Udans. he has Udans, but Udans was not the only one. There right. were other magicians that had them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we could, we could talk about Copperfield's museum for the next hour. I'm oh, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to bring this thing back to you here. Uh, you've published several books and DVDs over the years, and everything you do is awesome. Do you have any new books in the works? Any new DVDs in the works? Nothing new. But um, a re-release of something old. There was a, the the only book, actual book I wrote, uh, and I didn't even write it because David Agar was the author of Susan's Deceptions, which was published by Cameron. Uh, book all on close up magic, and um, uh, David's called the author, but I had to write half of it, so <laughs> or rewrite it. But um, uh, that and uh, Cameron also published by Chain Gang, which is my routine for the Endless Chain, which was a video which became a DVD. Both of those have been out of print. The book's only been out of print recently, but Chain Gang's been out of print, I, I guess, probably about three years. Um, and when Cameron uh, went out of business, the rights reverted back to me. So uh, I am putting those out very, very soon. I've had them digitally converted, so they will be available as digital products. 
Uh, don't ask me where, don't ask me when. Uh, but in the coming months, I, I had put all that together for SAM, so I'd have them available for people after my lecture. Um, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an email address if anybody's interested. They can contact me, and I'll let you know as soon as that. Well, how about this? Um, as soon as it's available, let me know, and I'll put it on my social Perfect. as well, Perfect. and I'll help promote it. I'll put it on that magicians group page that I run, and um, promote the heck That'd out of great. it for you. That'd yeah. There's there's a bunch of other things out there on the market. There are two videotapes. The first ones that I ever made for a company called MVN Magicians Video Network back in the early '80s. Uh, those are owned by Mayor Yedit and are still available through My Magic and My Magic. Uh, I did a four and a half hour lecture for Penguin, all on stand up material. Uh, and uh, if I say so myself, there's a lot of great material there. A lot Dude. of good workable stuff for guys who do real magic for real people and uh, that's available from penguin i have a uh, subscription to penguin i watch every single issue that comes out and yours i emailed you and told you how great it was and i gave it five stars yeah. it was awesome i loved it you did. yeah um let's see what the heck else is out there uh, well when i said you had oh, books that you published how many sets of lecture notes have you done over the years uh, a lot i know <laughs> yeah i i i don't i don't have count you know excuse me, what i've been doing in lectures lately the last new set of lecture notes was from four years ago and um it was called when i'm 64 again dating myself um so what i've been doing in lectures is offering a digital version of that and the previous lecture uh, lecture 2009 and um and that, that is a compilation of stuff from the, the L&L DVD series, Masterworks of Magic. Um, and uh, so I've been offering those uh, a digital package thing for people who are interested. Um, no, so, nothing new is planned right now. So how about tonight? How about tonight for podcast listeners? If they contact you, how do, what, what can they get? Can they get the two oh sets of lecture gosh. notes? Let's do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, if they want. I'm uh, putting I, you on the spot, man. Okay. Okay, uh, so um, here, here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. I will send you the files and have them just contact you. And if they are interested in the lecture notes. And, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the same package that I put together for the SEM lecture. So not only do you get the, uh, the two sets of lecture notes, but you will get also four other instruction sheets for three new close-up effects and my cone and ball routine. Now, it may be difficult because you didn't see me do it, but uh, it's a nice adjunct if you've done any work on cone and ball. If you've read Vernon's routine, uh, Vernon's Book of Magic, uh, his cone and ball work in there. So I just I just give you the outline of my routine. Of my routine, But um, uh, my new routine, Casino Coincidence, is in there, which is a great close-up routine. Um the Die of Destiny and the Cards to Pocket, uh, repeat Cards to Pocket is in there, and a trick called Duck Pond, with uh, little rubber duckies, which is a great, uh, a great parlor-sized effect for family audiences. It's a fun mental effect based on uh, duck ponds at the, uh, you know, at the fair. So if they want, they can have all that together for twenty bucks. Whoa, whoa, yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, that's what I was doing. Look, I, I, you know, I don't do this for a living. I want to, I, I want to share what I've come up with. So, you know, hey, you know, I want to make it affordable and, and give people a chance to explore some stuff. So, is that where do they email you at? Oh, if they want to just email me directly, it's uh, here's here's a good email address: f caps f k a p s at a o l dot com. Still rocking that AOL, huh? I am. I, you know, since <laughs> I've got that F caps. I can't give that up. Yeah, that's all right. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, I want, yeah, send me something that I can put on that magician's group as well. And I want to sure. send everybody to you. I don't want them coming to me and then something messing up, Mark. Right. I, 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 I if you know, if you know what I mean. Could, yeah, they can just email me and I'll get back to them and we'll, we'll do it by PayPal or something. And, uh, we can make that happen. And we have listeners in 42 different countries. <laughs> 
if they want to hire you for a lecture, do they just email FCAPS and try to work something out? Yeah, I'm not going to be doing any lectures uh, for a while because <laughs> it's tough to do a lecture when your hands in a splint. That's uh, all right, but I, I'm I'm counting on being being having full mobility back by the beginning of May. So uh, yeah, I'm hoping May. <laughs> all right, so uh, for lectures, inquire. Start booking now for June out. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Now, um, how old are your boys now? Uh, 14 and 18. Do they have any interest in magic at all? None. Uh, <laughs> does it does it my, hurt your heart or you one, got used my, to it at this my, point? My older one, Eric, um, you know, people, the MAS go goers watched him grow up. They watched both of them grow up, but, but Eric is the kid who was in the competition uh, when he was, you know, eight months old. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a funny routine, but Eric, um, he, he, you know, he, every year we did a school show, he would do a trick every year in the show. And, uh, when we go to conventions, he would do the youth activities. And so he, he got to do matrix and get critiqued by Lance Burton. Um, wow. That ain't bad. Um, so, uh, it was, it's funny. How much time do we have? We have eight minutes. Okay. So, uh, do you know who Moritz Mueller is? No. Okay. So, Moritz Mueller is this internet magic sensation guy who, like at the age of 13, just like blitzed the internet. He was on, he was on Ella DeGeneres, uh, cute blonde German kid who, um, uh, who came up with like one of the best versions of Three Fly I ever saw that was put out uh, on the market. It was great. And now, Moritz is continuing magic. Now he's not doing coins anywhere. Now he's into cards. Um, but very, very special young man, very nice young man, very bright young guy. I've known his dad since his dad was like 16 or 17. And, um, they were on a tour in America and they came over the house to visit and Moritz was just getting into coins. Uh, so we went down and we had pizza for dinner and then Eric and I and Thorsten and Moritz went downstairs and played magic for a few hours and, I had Mark show me some stuff and I get some tips and I taught him a couple of routines. Next thing I know, this kid is appearing on Ellen DeGeneres and he's it's what this thing is incredible. Anyway, wow. so back in that in that time period, Eric was doing stuff and he learned to do a very credible version of Matrix. And uh, and then every once in a while, you know, kids would come over and they'd say, Oh, your dad does magic, do you do anything? He says, Well, I have this one and he just pop out and he, he do matrix like he's been doing it every day of his life <laughs> so that's his trick that's awesome yeah it's fun <laughs> so and my younger one theo does tech for me when i do shows He'll, he likes running sound and, and lights and stuff but no interest in magic nope no nope uh, uh, i don't want to go to a magic show doesn't care um <laughs> So this is something I want to ask you because your knowledge of magic and all these names in magic. When I won Fool Us, having people pat me on the back and people that I've looked up to congratulate me. Man, it meant the world to me. Um, who sang your praises and patted you on the back that made your day back when you were winning all those awards? Anybody stand out? Wow. Uh, and mine might, be, mine might be psychological because I lost my dad when I was 25. My dad was my best friend. You know, having Penn give me a hug, man, it meant the world to me. And to have Penn sing sure praises did. over me, I mean, I could cry talking about how, how much that meant to me. So, sure. as, as far as you... And I, think, and I think I might have been one of the ones to congratulate you. Absolutely, on. absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I and I'll tell all the listeners, I've said it before, but I'll tell all the listeners, you were in that room that night, and when I showed you that trick, and people were guessing it was the wobble or whatever, and I was like, nope. And you were like, nope, I'm not seeing anything, but very good, Wes. And I'm like, if if Mark's not seeing what I'm doing, I'm on to something. And yeah. <laughs> and that gave me power. That gave me the go for itness to go take that to Penn and Teller and and win. So God bless That's you. Great. Thank you. Yes. That's great. And I've told you that story. I know I have. Oh yeah, you yeah. have. That you know, back in the day when I was when I was in my late teens, um, I went with the Philadelphia SAM group to New York to perform for the parent assembly as part of an exchange night. And I, one of the tricks I've been doing, you know, oh my gosh, for 50 years is, is uh, zombie. 
And in my act that night, I did zombie. And I had a guy come backstage named Co Norton. Well, Co is a professional actor, but a superb magician. Co's gone now. But Co was influential on me when I was 13 years old and saw him do zombie. Um, and he came back on stage and he, he, he said to me, they said, I really like the zombie. I said, so thank you. And he said, uh, how long did you study with Neil, Neil Foster? I went, I've never studied with Neil Foster. He says, really? I said, yeah. He says, you handle that thing a lot like Neil Foster. I said, I've never even seen Neil Foster. <laughs> so that was, that was a, that was a big one wow. from somebody that I, I looked up to. I mean, there's so many magicians over the years that, that, that I, I've been lucky enough to be friends with. When one, one year I was, I was in a, in a, competition show and Jay Marshall was the MC and when he introduced me, you know, you're just supposed to state their name. Well, Jay just couldn't do that. He had to just like sing my praises before I came out. I'm like, oh my god. It's like almost embarrassing, but it was it was so sweet because again, Jay's one of these people that I just looked up to because you know, he was just such, such an amazing pro. I've, I've been so lucky you know, even more than people singing my praises. I've been so lucky to have been friends with so many great professional mag magicians that I admire who have gladly shared with me their work over the years. And many times they've said, look, this is for you. Please don't show it to other magicians, but I want you to have this. Wow. And, and it would be a piece that I could use for my performances for performing for real people with a proviso that I don't share it with other magicians. Um, uh, Tommy Wonder, oh my God. One night, I followed him around to eight tables just to watch him do his wild card. And and, and at the end of the night, he, he looked at me and he says, did you get it yet? I said, I think I've got 90% of it. And I sat down <laughs> and said, okay, I've got this, this, this. Okay, come on. And he taught me the whole thing and said, you may perform this for audiences. Do not perform this for magicians. That's and so cool. it was another four years before the books came out, four or five years. And when he autographed my books, he, he wrote, now you can show them. Wow. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> well, and I think Jeff McBride had a quote about, you know, how cool magic is because you literally get to meet your idols and you'll become friends with them if you stay in the business long enough. And I've finally gotten to the point where I've become friends with my idols I've grown up with. And what an amazing turn of events that's become. It's, I love and magic. You know, and you know, magic is so special because of that. Yeah. I mean, I know of no other art form where the top professionals mingle and trade secrets with amateurs. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, you're you're not going to walk up to Eric Clapton and go, hey, I play guitar. Can you show me that lick? Yeah. <laughs> can, can I borrow your pick? <laughs> and then, yeah, right, <laughs> you're right, yeah. right, right. I forgot a pick. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Mark, we're out of time, buddy. Thank you so much, man. This was awesome. I think we could Thank do another you, six hours. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Wes, I love you too. And, and, and give, give those little babes a pat for me and send my love to natalie and, and i can't wait till we see each other again face to face absolutely man stay on the line i have a couple plugs real quick and we'll wrap everything up um on march 5th from 5 30 to 7 30 i'll be performing close-up magic at your table while you're experiencing an amazing multi-course meal at the lafayette inn in standardsville this is an annual event that sells out every single year so get your tickets today by visiting lafayette the lafayette inn.com and reserve your table today our television show, Wes Isley's Magic Life, has been picked up by Golden Media Syndication. They're now selling our show across the nation, so check your local listings. If we're not on your local cable channel, check out uh, Nudu that's on Roku. Do you have Roku? If you have Roku, check out Nudu and look at Wes Isley's Magic Life, and you can watch it at home. And last but not least, check out our merch at WesIsley.com. That's logo t-shirts. TV podcast t-shirt, Magic Man hats, stickers, playing cards, and more. We have a show this Friday. Okay. See you next week. <laughs> Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind-the-scenes videos, blooper videos, 
never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. Thank you.